when we study the different verses in the Torah, we often find what seems to be like grammatical inconsistencies. And when we actually study these verses with the great insight that the Rebbe offers to us, we begin to see how these are not inconsistencies at all, but they're very precise. And they offer us much deeper meaning and understanding of what the verses are teaching us. One such example is when the Jewish people uh, crossed the Red Sea. Um, it says, Vayar Ha'am, the people saw. And the word Vayar doesn't say Vayiru, which would be plural. But it says Vayar, they saw as if they were a singular entity. And then it says, Vayiru Ha'am es Hashem, that the people feared. And Vayiru, using a plural terminology in the very same verse, Vayaminu Bashem, and they had faith in God. Again, Vayaminu, speaking about they, plural, had faith in God. So the verse begins by seeing that, saying that they saw singular, and then it says that they feared and they had faith in, in, in plural. And even though it's the exact same verse. And at the, we also have another verse, which is in this week's Torah portion. It says that when the Jewish people saw the thunder and lightning at Mount Sinai, it says, Vayar ha'am vayanu, that the uh, people saw Vayar again, it doesn't say Vayiru, which would be plural, it says Vayar, as, as if saying, and he saw. And then it says Vayanu, and they trembled. Vayamdu, and they stood Merachok from a distance. Vayamdu again, plural. So it jumps from singular to plural in the very same verse, which, is, which would seem to be a grammatical inconsistency. So the Rebbe explains that when a group does something as a group, if the action that they're doing is something in which one person doesn't differ from the other in that action, everyone does it exactly the same way, then the verse will refer to it in the singular, as if a singular entity did this. But if the group um, is doing an activity, which they're all doing together, but each person does it in a different way or on a different <laughs> level because it varies between, between person and person in the way they do this, then it will speak of it in plural. So that's why in both of these verses, when it speaks about the Jewish people seeing something, when two people look at the same thing, they look in the very same way. They, they, they use their eyes and they see what's happening. However, the effect of what they're seeing, which is an emotional effect, which means that they feared or they had faith or they trembled in this way, everyone is impacted differently by what they see. And therefore, when it speaks about the impact of what they saw, it speaks about it in a plural Form. So that's why in the very same verse, we can have the Torah speaking of the Jewish people in a singular uh, tense, and then speak of the Jewish people in the very same verse in a plural tense. This is very significant to a subject that the Rebbe raises in this week's Torah portion, and in understanding the preciseness that Rashi uses in discussing this subject in the weekly Torah portion. Um, and it, it actually... Before we get to the verse that is the focus of this uh, talk that the Rebbe gave, the Rebbe mentions as well another verse which, which, which seems to parallel, uh, although it's not precise, and that is what one of the main uh, um, comparisons we're going to be making between what the Jewish people experienced and what the Egyptians experienced. Because when the Egyptians were ch chasing the Jewish people in last week's Torah portion, the Torah tells us, Yisu b'nei Yisrael, say name. the Jewish people lifted up their eyes, name Yitzrayim, they say Acharem, and suddenly the Egyptians are ch chasing after them. That was a, a, a point of great concern. Um, and Rashi highlights the words, Noseya Acharehem, chasing after them. Now the word Noseya is in singular, even though it's talking about multitudes of Egyptians chasing the Jews. It says, Nosea, singular, achareim, they singular chasing, as if an individual is chasing after the Jewish people. And um, Rashi comments and says, Belev echad, that the, the Egyptians, the reason why it, it, it refers to the, it, the Egyptians chasing in singular, that verb is written in singular, is because the Egyptians were chasing after the Jews, Belev echad, with one heart. Ki ish echad, as if they were one person. That's what Rashi says. Why does Rashi say this? Because, and why does Rashi highlight, Rashi specifically, it says, Mitzrayim no se'achreim, the Egyptians were chasing after the Jews, but Rashi doesn't highlight Mitzrayim no se'achreim. Rashi specifically highlights just the words no se'achreim. 
because Rashi wants to focus on the idea that the reason why the, the Torah uses a singular verb of nosea, that chasing in singular, that singular entity was teaching the Jewish people, is not because they were Mitzrayim, because the Egyptians were unified in their chasing after the Jews, but because nosea acharehem, because they were chasing after the Jews, meaning that their unity came from the fact that they that their hate for the Jewish people was unified, with that they had equal hatred. And Rashi says that the verse has to point this out to us because we know that hate is an emotion. And that would be an act that typically would vary between person and person. Not no two people hate on the exact same uh, level. And therefore the Torah tells us a a, a chiddush, a novelty, a unique thing. That we're writing Nosea in singular to let you know that even though typically when it comes to emotions, people vary widely, the Egyptians all hated the Jews with equal hatred. Although you would think that Paro's hate for the Jews was on one level, the magicians in the, in, 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 were on a different level. You know, uh, the, 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 we know that there were the Egyptians who feared God more, feared God less, based on the way they reacted by the Ten Plagues. So there would be varied hate. The Torah tells us they all hated the Jews equally. And that's why the Torah specifically says no seah, that they were that they were chasing, but it uses a singular tense for the verb. So we should know that that something we would not realize on our own that their hate came from their common hate for the Jewish people. So it didn't come from the fact that the Egyptians were a unified people, but that their hate of the Jewish people is unified. And therefore, Rashi specifically writes that believe echad they had a common heart, a common emotion, and that created an outcome of their common emotional hate for the Jews was that they were acting as if they were one person. So the levechad, the emotional state of one heart, is what prompted that they should appear to be as if they're one, one, one entity. Now, in contrast, we have a pasuk in our, in our parsha which says that the Jewish people... They traveled from Rafidim. Midbar Sinai. They came to the desert of Sinai, Sinai Desert. Um, and they plural encamped. Vayachnu means and they encamped. The word Vayichan would mean he encamped. Vayachnu means they encamped, plural. So it says Vayachanu Bamidbar, they encamped in the desert. And right after that, the very next word is Vayichan Sham Yisrael Negadahar. And the Jewish people encamped, but it says Vayichan singular, opposite the mountain. Very strange. And Rashi comments here and says, very similar commentary to the Egyptians chasing the Jews, but re- in reverse. Rashi says, Ki'ishecha, they were like one person. Belevecha, then therefore with one heart. In their excitement and their exuberance and desire to receive the Torah from God. So what Rashi is focusing on over here is that the Jewish people um, the, uh, the, the, the Jewish people, when they came to Mount Sinai and they, and they uh, were preparing themselves for receiving of the Torah, preparation for receiving of the Torah is a spiritual endeavor. And every person is on a different spiritual level, and therefore the, uh, the, 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 uh, the position of every person spiritually in preparation for the Torah is going to vary. So Rashi wonders, why would the Torah say Vayichan, that they encamped as in the singular, when, again, this is an activity which was really pluralistic. It varied between person and person. So therefore Rashi comes and says that when the Jewish people came to Mount Sinai, they forged among themselves a very profound unity. And that's why Rashi highlights, unlike when he highlights the words by the Egyptians chasing the Jews, he only highlighted the words, Nosea Achareim, chasing after them. He doesn't highlight Mitzrayim Nosea Achareim, that the Egyptians were chasing after them, because that's irrelevant. The, the unity was created by their common hate. But Rashi says over here it's different. Vayichan Shom Yisrael, that the Jewish people's unity was not from um, their, 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 their spiritual disposition in preparation for the receiving of the Torah. But that the Jewish people, when they came to Mount Sinai, they, they, they tapped into the very essence of their soul, 
which we know that the that there is a single um, organism, if you will, a single common soul, root soul that all Jewish souls come from, and fr- and from that level, every at the root of the es- and the essence of every Jewish soul, all of us are equal. There is no difference or hierarchy or levels on the level of the essence of our soul. The Jewish people were able to tap into the essence of their soul when they stood before Mount Sinai. And and this is expressed by the word Yisrael, their Jewishness. And this is what created a unity, a unity that they stood before Mount Sinai Ki'ishecha, truly as, as one person. Of course, the Jewish people are really one person in our root. And in the reverse of what happened with the Egyptians, out of the fact that we were in touch with the fact that we are a single organism and a single entity, that from that evolved something magical, which is that we in fact then all experienced a, a sense and desire and a yearning for the receiving of the Torah on the very same level, as if we had one heart, which otherwise would, 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 would typically um, vary um, greatly. And the Rebbe explains that this teaches us a very profound lesson. What it teaches us is that we know that, um, as, as this is discussed in a spiritual sense, we know that there are two types of domains in a very general sense in the world of Jewish law. There's something called a Rishus Rabbim, which means a Rishus is a domain, and a Rabbim means public, uh, where you have many, many people. Uh, you have a Rishus Hayachid, a singular domain, a domain that's owned by one person. That's not uh, that, that's not uh, uh, owned by a community or by the public. And the Torah, in a spiritual sense, I'm sorry, in the spiritual sense of the world, is referred to as Rosh Hashanah, a public domain. What does that mean when we say that the, the world is a public domain? Because the world that we live in, the physical world, is is a world of multiplicity. It's made up of an endless number of individual uh, existences. And each one of them stands on its own and seems to be independent of everything else and uh, with no apparent association between one thing and another. And this is especially expressed by humanity, by human beings, because human beings, we know our sages teach us in Deo San Shavas that, p- that the people all see things very differently and understand things very differently. We have very varied opinions. Uh, we differ in many ways. And um, so this idea of Rishus Harabim, of disparity, of, of multiplicity, of pluralism is expressed very much by the by the by by humankind. Now, unity is created in this world by revealing the oneness of God, which is an entity which is above or higher than in hierarchy than the world and really the source of the world. So when we very very individual beings tap into and become aware of the fact that we all come from one entity, which is God who brings everything into existence, that is how we create unity. When we step into the unity of God in a certain respect. Now this revelation happens through two, two avenues. And these two avenues are the two avenues which preceded the world and the pluralism of the world. And, and when I say preceded the world, it means that God conceived of and in a spiritual sense already created these two entities. And they are the Torah, the wisdom of the Torah. And they are the Jewish people. As, a, a, um, as an entity in spirit, such as our souls, even though the world was not, um, was not created yet. And it is through the Torah and the Yisrael, the Jewish people, that um, we can bring unity of the oneness of God into the universe. And this is why Rashi explains that the unity created, that the, Rashi highlights specifically, Vayichan Shem Yisrael, that the Jewish Yisrael encamped there, because it's, it, Rashi is emphasizing in the spiritual sense that the Jewish people were able to actualize this essential unity that lies within the Jewish people, which is an expression of and an emanation of the very essence of our soul, in which no two Jews are different. The essence of all of our souls are really come from the very same source, root soul, and they are exactly the same. And on that level, we are higher than the differences that exist among us. And there are no differences of opinion on that level, because on that level, we step above our individuality 
and we are existing from a level of unity. And that's what happened when the Jewish people um, came to uh, Mount Sinai. And out of the fact that the Jewish people were able to tap into the essence of their soul and experience a oneness amongst themselves, this led to, this Ish Echad led to a Lev Echad, a singular heart in which their desire to receive the Torah was common and equal as well because they were able to, to develop this feeling in their heart out of the very essence, the unity that they created through the very essence of their soul. Now, we know that Hashem created the world Zel Umazeh. Zel Umazeh means that Hashem um, created an evenly balanced world where wherever there is power in, on the holy side, there's also power on the unholy side, what we refer to as the, the, the realm of Klippa. Klippa, again, meaning a shell that covers up on the light of God, on the truth of God. Egypt represents Klippa, negativity in a spiritual sense, and the Jewish people express Kedusha, holiness, in a spiritual sense. And so therefore, the Egyptians also experienced a similar, although not precisely the same, but at least similar to, because God creates some balance, although it's not exactly the same, a similar experience of unity, although it was reversed. Their unity came out of their heart first, and then led to an apparent it seemed, it seemed to be that they were one entity as a people. But they truly aren't one entity as a people, and that's because they don't have the divine soul, the Jewish soul, which is the divine soul, which is what creates the Jewish people to be, be uh, a single organism. Uh, the Egyptians um, are, in fact, um, individual and not one entity. So they're not really capable of ultimately experiencing ish echad, be the, the, the experience of being one people. Um, the Jewish people were ultimately able to experience ish echad, that experience of being one entity of a people, because of the Jewish soul and the essence of the Jewish soul. Now, although it's not possible for the, 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 non, uh, the, the, uh, the Egyptians and the non-Jews to experience this oneness as a people, the way the Jewish people do, simply because of the makeup, um, the different makeup between the Jews and, and Gentiles. But the, uh, the, um, the, we know that when Hashem gave the Torah to the Jewish people, the Medrash tells us that up until that point, there was God, God so to speak, created um, zones. There was the heavenly zone and there was the created zone, the, 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 the earthly zone. And the divine wisdom remained above, and human wisdom only human wisdom pervaded on this world. And when God gave the Torah, God broke these boundaries, the boundaries that separated these two zones, so that now the divine wisdom would be able to pervade on this uh, on this world. When God did this, and God broke the boundaries between above and below. This not only create empowered, gave the Jewish people the power to fulfill the 613 commandments and study Torah and infuse the world with, with divinity, but it also gave a non-Jew who does not have this unique divine um, godly soul to be, also be able to perceive the presence of God that lies within each human being who is created by God. So it actually gave access to all human beings and really all, all of creation to become aware of the divine and to experience on some level at least, uh, some level of a oneness, of awareness that everything comes from God and that they come from God and that we, that every, everything comes from God and therefore to begin to experience this, a, a, some level of oneness. And this is actually expressed in Jewish law because we know that the, uh, that the Gentile world is commanded with commandments too, and they are the seven Noahide laws. So we see that God gives them a divine mission, because they have a mission of, of revealing on, uh, in, in their capacity a oneness between the world and, 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 and Almighty God. And, and, and the Rebbe emphasizes that their observance of the seven Noahide laws should be not only because they make sense, but because God commanded that they fulfill these commandments. Because when a person does a commandment from God, even if we have an understanding of why God commands us to do this, but we do it specifically because God commanded us to do it, then we are in fact revealing the presence of God in this world in a much greater fashion. 
And being that all of existence has a, an obligation, as the Talmud tells us, to say, Bishvili Nivra Olam, that the entire universe was created for me. This is true for all existence, whether it's an inanimate object, whether it's a Gentile, or whether it's a Jew that every single one of us needs to say that the world was created for me and I need to express the divine in this world. So therefore, it calls upon every single one of us to influence um, the non-Jews that we interact with in knowing about the seven Noahide laws so that they can take on their mission and they can also be a part of creating more unity in this pluralistic world by unifying everything with the awareness of God to the extent that they are able to, just like a Jew is re- is expected and required to reveal the unity of God to the extent that we are able to, which is a much full, in a much fuller fashion.